Hey everybody, welcome here with me, Martin Kralp, and a very, very, very astonishing person, a photographer being well known all around the world, Greg Gorman. Nice to have you here, Greg. Good to be here. Um, we just left Zingst, the, the, the photo festival in Zingst this morning, came here to Hamburg and uh, well, you've been to Zingst as well. Yeah, giving, I think this is my third or fourth time. Yeah, and, and we ask you to kindly attach one day for this interview, staying in Hamburg and then leaving for Norway this morning. I leave tomorrow morning for Norway to do a workshop there. So really, really glad to have you here. Thank you so much, Greg. You're like one of my biggest idols. Mm -hmm. I'm impressed that uh, you came in. I told you my schedule was so tight. I'm happy to give you a few hours to do this, but here's my guidelines. And I couldn't <laughs> believe you got up at four o'clock this morning and drove here from Zinx to set all of this up. For Crazy. you, I would have been yeah. like... I Not the night we up. met. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> but don't talk about that. Okay, okay please. <laughs> we Germans love beer. And I sometimes, sometimes we do need Kind of that relaxed outlet to chill out and yeah. unwind. I agree. Yeah. I did yeah. the last night of my workshop. I drank a lot of wine. So. Okay. <laughs> you have an addiction to what? Not an addiction, but like, sorry for my false English. No, I'm, addiction's I'm, not a bad uh, word. Uh, I love wine. But sure. you have like a wine, um, you have your own wine. In I California. make a little bit of wine up in Napa Valley. Yes. I have since 2006. You have like, you, know, you have a, like a residence and, and, and with wine. Well, I source fruit. Uh, through what was formerly Orrin Swift, and I make a little wine up in the Napa Valley, yeah, for 11 years now. Okay, I would love to make some beer, but it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's talk about photography. It's, um, it's going to be an interview with Greg Gorman, um, one of the greatest photographers still being alive, and... Uh, Barely, but... <laughs> no, no, I hope for a few more years. I hope years. for a few more years, too. Um, let's have a look at his... Shots and I'm I'm just like speechless because because when I'm going through your shots, the names, the faces, the 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 guys and girls you have been working with, they are one of the biggest stars of our time. Perhaps everybody knows how how the name in, in English. Johnny Depp. You no, know, not the not the actor, but like the oh the Pirates of the Caribbean. Pirates of the Caribbean. In Germany, it's different. It's uh, different it's names. Different, yeah, different name. Um, they, Jason's Jason Statham I photographed Statham. on uh, a movie called The Italian Job. We shot that in Venice, Italy. But and I've always loved his action pictures. I think he's great. This is actually Tom Cruise, isn't it? Right. Tom, I photographed before anybody really knew who he was. We were, uh, I was shooting him for Andy Warhol's magazine interview, and it was for a first impression. And I walked with him down on Santa Monica Boulevard to a local park, and we make this picture. Yeah. But at that time, no one knew who Tom Cruise was. He had just made a film which was about to be released called Risky Business. But over the course of time and the establishment of celebrity, he became, you know, a big star. If I tried to walk to a park with Tom today, it would be a different story. <laughs> um, one of the most important, but, but one of the most adorable shots of yours is this one. I love it. I really love it. It's Michael Jackson. Michael was, uh, as all, was always a great subject to photograph. Whenever we would do a shoot over the course of many years that we worked together, he would call me maybe two weeks out before the session, and we would talk on the phone for like an hour, hour and a half, and discuss what we were going to shoot. It was really like working with an art director. And on the occasion of this shoot with the uh, tarantula, Michael said he had pet tarantulas, and they had just shed their skin. So this and is not the, actually a It's a real tarantula, but it's the skin of the real tarantula. So he, he said they, they shed their skin and it looks exactly like the spiders. So he brought a couple of them to the photo session and what we did is we actually gaffers taped it to his head. <laughs> and that became a pretty famous picture of him. Absolutely. And um, we're going to be looking over, over some more of your shots, but I guess all of our viewers, they're going to be knowing right now what kind of big photographer we're talking to and they are listening to. Um, what do you think is special about photography? What is your, what is your approach to photography? Why, why is it like what you're doing for years and, and still do it? You, you, you would be able to just rest and, and, and relax and you're still doing workshops, you're doing photo shoots, you, 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 photo shot, shot the, you shot the guy with the apple, the green apple? Oh, I just recently Udo Kier. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I've always been a people person, Martin, and I've always jokingly said I've never been able to photograph anything that couldn't talk back to me. So <laughs> my entire career has been 
an interchange between people and getting to know people. And uh, I grew up in the Midwest in Kansas City, so I think the people from the Midwest of America are more down to earth. Certainly, unfortunately, they're more Trump supporters, and that's not me. <laughs> but uh, the people, I think, from the Midwest are actually uh, very centered people. And I love working. I always uh, started out photographing people at the beginning of my career, and I kind of stuck with it. Now, mostly, my passion for all the motion picture work and, and celebrity work that I did has changed. Uh, it's no, no longer is that my passion. And I think with photography, like anything, any career, any, any avocation, uh, it's important that you have passion. And when I started losing my passion about that kind of work around 2005 or so, I really spent and started focusing all my time on education and teaching and obviously and also making wine up in the Napa Valley. So that's what's kind of driven me now is, uh, is working more in the field of education. Um, you, you told me that there was one event, one occasion, where you actually in 2005, I guess, lost Yes, it, what happened was um, most of my career was shooting motion picture campaigns. And um, usually art directors would hire a photographer based upon their talent. And I don't mean one photographer is better than another, but certain photographers are better at shooting certain things. They have a style. I think I had my own style. Herb Ritz had his style, Bruce Weber, Robert Maplethorpe. And uh, I was hired actually to photograph uh, a film called King Arthur. And at the time I was shooting... I'd worked with Kira Knightley previously on uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, and we knew each other and we'd shot together. So she knew that I knew how to photograph her. And at the point in time that we were shooting this, the art director asked me to basically reverse the lights and shoot a little bit different angle. And I said, you know, I don't think she's going to look quite the same. Celebrities oftentimes have certain angles, certain sides, certain ways that they are shot. It's, it's funny because there's other angles that they look a little bit different. And... Uh, Based upon what they wanted, I said, you know, I don't feel that's, you know, you need to tell her that that's what you want. And they said, no, you're the photographer. And at that point, I thought, you know, I don't want to lose my credibility. I've spent my life and my career basically building relationships, earning the trust and confidence of talent. And that's what got me the future jobs. And uh, so at this point, I was starting to become a little bit disillusioned. And later, as you know, they gave her yeah, breasts and everything else in the picture, which was, you know, totally... It's pretty ridiculous. I mean, it had nothing to do with me. When you're a work for hire with a studio, they basically buy out the artwork that you photograph for them, and they basically can do what they want with it. Yeah, I, I've, I've read the article in, in German newspapers. Uh, yes. It was a big deal. It was a big deal. Because, like, she has not that much... Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I think that Kira wanted to look like herself. I, I think she's a beautiful. She is, she's gorgeous, and uh, she had everything she needed. You know? yeah, But it's just... It's just You know, I worked for 45 years in the movie business and, and, and enjoyed a great career and a run in it. And it got to the point that, you know, the looks were changing, the styles were changing, my style wasn't as so much in vogue. And uh, I didn't want to have to answer to an art director when my relationships with the talent I was photographing are what helped my, launch my career, not my relationships with the art directors. So, so you were basically standing on the set and, and someone else told you to, to go to an artist you already knew good yes. and tell her to... You basically lied to her, like, like say it's your idea and she's going to be looking better this way, but you, don't, you didn't think. Anything. More or less, more or less. It just was, it just, you know, it just got to where, uh, you know, I mean, when you're a work for hire, you have to basically do what they tell you. Yeah. But at the same time, you don't have to be the fall guy for it. At least I wasn't going to be at that stage of my yeah, career, yeah, yeah. the fall guy for this person's request. Whether it's right or wrong, I'm not faulting what he wanted to do. I'm just saying you I knew that to. she was be quite aware that, shooting from the angle they wanted, lit from the angle they wanted, that wouldn't be coming from me. Okay, okay. Very interesting. So y you already told me just a few seconds ago that some of the stars, they, they know photography quite well. They know lighting and they know how they look good. They wouldn't be able to like, do it themselves, but they I actually think that, you know, know. I think, yes, I think that um, one of the things that established a lot of us in the day with a lot of the talent. In other words, a lot of the talent had their own photographers that photographed them. I know a lot, I worked like a lot with Warren Beatty, for example, and I knew with Warren, don't show up at his house before three or four o'clock in the afternoon. Make sure you have really <laughs> long lenses and, and, and shoot. It cuts out the riffraff, all the bullshit in between. It's not like coming to meet somebody for the first time, hi, how are you? And then trying to get to that point that's where you're going to be making successful pictures. When you build a relationship with the talent that you're photographing and an understanding and a trust and a confidence, 
that they know you can get the job done. One, they're relaxed, and two, you're going to have a more successful photo session. And that's a big part of um, working in personality photography. It's building that relationship. Greg, it's, it's so interesting because I don't, I'm not sure if, if all the, the viewers understand what you just said in, in those few minutes we, we, we were already talking. I think you had a very important point. You said Michael called you with an idea. Michael Jackson called you with yes. an idea. And like you just said, okay, let's do it. And, and you, you, you're telling me that another star, he has like, like don't show up before three. So, so it's not only like your ideas. It's like the, the working together. So well, it's building a relationship. So I worked for you know, a million years with Bette Midler. And I knew the angles, Ben, Barbara Streisand. You know the angles that look best with them. You know how to get the pictures. And they don't have to be put in a compromised situation to try to explain to a photographer how they're going to look best. And uh, I think one of the things that was interesting early in my career, I didn't do a lot of editorial outside of really Interview Magazine yeah. where we had full creative control because many art directors wanted those more uncomfortable moments, those shots in between. And I never was really about that. I was more about the fact that I'm working with a celebrity and it's their time as well as it's my time and it's in both of our best interests to get a good shot, not to get that kind of uh, compromising image Uh, that editorial image that's kind of outside the realm of how they want to be personified, so to speak. Let's, let's, let's talk about Tom Waits' pictures. Um, you said just a few minutes ago when we were talking and Before. setting up all the cameras, you had three days yeah. for, with, with, yeah. with like a, a superstar, a Hollywood right. superstar. I was shooting with Tom Waits, and he was a pretty big star at that point, but in the late 70s, so we go back a few years. <laughs> And Tom was living in an apartment at the Tropicana Hotel, which was down the street from my home in L.A. off Santa Monica Boulevard in La Cienega. And I don't remember if it was uh, Atlantic Studios or A&M, I can't remember. We were doing a shoot uh, with Tom for an album cover called Heart Attack and Vine. And uh, I had three days with Tom Waits. I'd pick him up at early in the morning at his apartment, and we would go out and shoot for 10 or 12 hours. Sometimes I didn't get him home until after midnight. And we'd do eight or ten setups. We'd go all over L.A. shooting. And we just would do amazing pictures. And, of course, Tom was so creative and such an extraordinary artist on every level. Uh, we had a great time. And on the third day, uh, the studios were so happy with the pictures we'd been creating. We shot in, like, crazy place, tattoo parlors and graveyards of old <laughs> signs, you know, neon yeah, signs. Yeah, we yeah. shot up at the Griffith Park Observatory, downtown underneath the freeways. Amazing. And the studio said... Greg, we'd love to have a picture of Tom in a tuxedo. And I said, never going to happen. <laughs> I go, what do you mean? Not going to happen. I said, they said, where would you ask him? So I said, I'd ask him. So this afternoon of the second day of the shoot, the end of the day, I said to Tom, listen, Tom, uh, the studio would really love to have a picture of you in a tuxedo. And Tom, in his inimitable voice, says to me, well, the only way I'd wear a fucking tuxedo, I'd probably get shot. <laughs> so he agreed to do the tuxedo. We had to get a gun. We had to get glycerin and fake blood. So this We was had to the put idea. a girl in the background of the picture. Had to sweat him up a little bit, and we shot the pictures. Later, now we're talking about the 70s, so if you do the math back to the 70s and realize that Uh, the studio spent over $3,000 airbrushing the blood out of the picture so they could use the photograph. Pretty crazy. <laughs> the irony of this story, really, uh, Martin, is the fact that today, I would say now it's been maybe 15 years ago even, um, I had a shoot with Tom Waits for the London Sunday Times. And Tom and I knew each other. But at the same time, Tom said to me to meet him at a Chinese diner in Santa Rosa, California, where he lives, and I had 30 minutes to shoot a seven-page editorial for the London Sunday Times. Seven-page, 30 minutes. Yeah. So I had to show up to the location. Fortunately, there was a railroad track outside behind the Chinese diner, which was terrible. And I took him outside. And Tom improvises, you know. I mean, he's brilliant. So, you know, he can just make a little move, a little twist, and you get a great picture. So we made it. But it shows you the difference of how things have transgressed, transpired, so to speak, from, you know, 30, 40 years ago to today. It's a different world. It's, well, I, I do work as a photographer as well, and this is like kind of hard because I experience the same. I don't have the, I don't have the comparison because I'm, 
haven't been taking pictures 45 years ago, but sometimes you, I have the feeling that you just can't do it in that time and with that little money. So sometimes it's just, just the wishes from the companies, they, they're unrealistic. Like, they are unrealistic, but it can be done in that time. That's the yeah, but you, especially you, today. You knew today. him. You knew him. But back then with film, it was much more difficult. Oh, this is the this thirty minute job film. was 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 still film. Still film. Okay. Yeah, and you know, by the time you get the Polaroid and you take the picture, it's uh, thirty minutes done. <laughs> but you know, I'm working in the movie business and shooting motion picture campaigns. Oftentimes, we would be thrown up against a wall and given a very short window to create an image. I remember we built a huge set for a, a movie called, I think it was Brewster's Millions with Richard Pryor. And I had this huge set built, you know, cost thousands and thousands of dollars. And Richard came in and I had 30 minutes to get the picture after having the studio had spent a fortune. This is uh, kind of crazy. You know, it's part of the world of celebrity. It's a crazy world. It That's is. why I'm not doing that these days. That's why I'm teaching. I can go to bed at night and sleep kind of with, a, with a good conscience. Making wine. This is really important. Um, how did you get started? This is, um, you, you told me this was your first big movie um, poster? Uh, my, the, the first really famous movie poster. I got started, I borrowed a friend's camera in 1968 to shoot a Jimi Hendrix concert for the first time I ever took a picture. And... Uh, He said, shoot Tri-X film, Greg. We had really good seats in Kansas City to see Jimi Hendrix. And I thought, well, I better take some pictures, knowing nothing about photography. This is <laughs> 19, 1968, so we're going I back a couple years. I better take some pictures. <laughs> so he said, shoot Tri-X film, shoot a 60th of a second, F5.6, you know, you'll get a picture. So the following morning, we processed the film. And as the pictures were coming up in the uh, developer, in the fix, and I saw this... Uh, image coming out of nowhere from a white piece of paper. I was pretty well hooked. And the photograph was rather out of focus. But the irony was I didn't know if it was out of focus because I shot at a 60th of a second or I'd smoked too much pot that night at the concert. So <laughs> needless to 68. say, <laughs> 1968, I actually had hair and I was skinny. And, uh, you, you still are. And that's why I'm wearing black. <laughs> But uh, that's how it all kind of got started. And then slowly but surely it was being in the right place at the right time. And I was asked to work with Dustin on Tootsie. And uh, the movie was interesting because Dustin was promised a day during the filming from the director, Sidney Pollack, that he could become famous. And he said, I want to do a photo shoot with Greg. So I'm actually in the movie. And that picture was actually taken during the production of the film. Um, was it, was it, diff like, was the, you said you were amazed by a picture coming up from a plain white paper. Was there more magic in taking pictures in analog times than in digital times? Was there um, like I don't know whether there's more magic. I think there was certain inherent understanding that's missing today. I mean, today, everyone's a photographer. They all have an iPhone and Photoshop to prove it. It's not like the real world. I mean, I'm so grateful for the fact that I learned in the analog days, I learned what an f-stop was, what a shutter speed was, what a ASA was back then before ISO, basically yeah, the yeah, same thing. Yeah. And learned that Thank way, you. <laughs> manually, manually. Um, today, everything is on autofocus, auto exposure. People get a great shot, but they're hard pressed to duplicate it. If you ask them to say, oh, I love this picture you took. I'd like a picture of me like that. They wouldn't know what the hell to do. And that's the unfortunate thing. Um, when I'm teaching, everybody has to set their cameras on manual. Everybody has to take a manual reading. I push them back a few years so they kind of actually learn how to understand and see light and how to communicate with the talent. That's a big part of, you know, when I'm teaching my workshops, those are the two most important elements I try to get across to the, uh, sub, to the students. Let's make a small, not break, but let's, let's make a f small... In, uh, we are here in Sunbound's headquarters and, and, and you are traveling all around Europe giving workshops. You also have uh, the possibility of, of, of attending a, a fantastic workshop in California. I looked at it for several times and uh, you're touring throughout Europe, also Germany and Austria and Switzerland. And one can come to you to California to, to attend a week, isn't it? Like a week. Most of the workshops I teach are week long workshops. Um, I'm doing a series this summer over here. I do this time of year, I, I start, I'm, I have a class at the School of Visual Arts in New York that's a private uh, 
part of a college there. And then I come over and I teach with the Atelier Youngworth. Yeah, and I very do, famous. Uh, I, I do three, four workshops a year with them. We're doing one in, uh, in uh, Styria, South Styria, near Graz, Austria, yeah. and following with one in Italy and one in France. And they're fun, Martin, because we basically rent an entire castle for a week. And the students shoot in the same location for a week, but the castles are massive. And they can see how light changes, the whole evolution of light. And uh, we do the mostly natural light. I work with uh, California Sunbounce, which I love their gear, and we shoot um, with reflectors and silks and whatnot that I've been working with, actually, for many years, long before I hooked up with Peter at, at California Sunbounce. I bought a reflector from Sammy's Camera in L.A. And I Sammy's it. Camera? Yeah. Was I, that like the most... That was the big camera store. It still is the big camera store in L.A. It would be like B&H in New York. Not okay. that big, but it's, a, it's still a big company. But I, what I loved is the durability. They were the first reflectors that actually were solid. You know, They last a long time, and they weren't made out of plastic, and they were great. So I still work with them. It's, they're great products. So in the castle, we, just, we basically see the, uh, the movement of light as, throughout the course of the day, and we just use a little bounce fill sometimes. Or sometimes we shoot even with black to kind of subtract the light. You know what, what, what Peter is always telling me? Peter is the, Peter is the head of, 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 of Sunbounce. He's like an astonishing photographer as well. He's, he's a great photographer. He's won many awards. Yeah. He, he shot kings and queens and, and all around the world. And he, he, whenever we talk about you, he's telling me that you are the only one really being able to see the, 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 that cage, that Sunbounce cage, and really being able to use it Well, um, I, that came from a, a cage that I built on my rooftop of my studio in L.A. long before we, I ever developed it for California Sunbounce. We, uh, so this was I, your idea? Oh, yeah. I built the original cage on the roof of my studio in L.A. It was basically a three-wall uh, uh, available light solution. So what was the idea? So like, 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 let's step away from Sunbounce? Yeah, and, 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 and when I started there, really, what I was using for bounce, what I basically, on the rooftop, I built from PVC piping a three-wall cage. We could have a black, a silk on one side where your main light was coming through, which I just bought silk fabric and created. And actually for my bounce fill then, I actually had a 10 by 10 white psych that I could move around on wheels to kick the light into the uh, cage. But now we designed a portable version. That this one you couldn't take with you. This is you know, <laughs> solid. Now the cage you know, kind of comes apart into uh, uh, you know, a bunch of pieces and you kind of put it together pretty easily. And, Better to have a couple people to put it together, but it's great because you can take it on the road and shoot any time of the day. You shot on your rooftop. Why? Like the rooftop of my studio because for the natural light. So you always loved sunlight. You know, my whole career was built inside the studio. I got so damn tired of shooting with flash and in the studio that you know it was kind of a breath of fresh air, so to speak, to get outside <laughs> and start shooting more natural light. So I work now. I don't really even work with flash very much. I shoot with. Uh, these exquisite LEDs from Rotolite. I work mostly yeah. with Rotolite, which I really, really like, which is a continuous light and, a, and an affordable continuous light. Yeah. When I first started working with continuous <laughs> light, yeah, I worked with a 6K HMI, yeah. which cost a mere $30,000 back I then. Know, you know, know, you had a ballast that was like 10 or 12,000 and you had a $20,000 light. It was, you know, if it I was, wasn't working my ass off it, in those days, who could afford to buy something like that? It, it was so hot. They were the, hot, you couldn't touch the light. LEDs yeah. are not hot, so yeah. they're fantastic. And the new ones, uh, the ones that Road Light makes, are, the skin tones are great. They're fantastic. So uh, I work with LEDs, and I work with California Sun Bounce and Natural Light. That's kind yeah. of my tools of the trade these days. No, no, no. All no, portable okay. and all simple stuff, you know. All simple stuff, because f fixation on, on technique is, 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 is not... Is overrated. Yeah? Technique is overrated. I mean, I think it's about being able to communicate with a person and being able to pull out of them what it is you're looking for in a photograph. So many times I'm teaching and I have students come and they're dripping with the Leica cameras and they've got this and that and they feel if they didn't have all of these tools, they couldn't take a great picture. And it's such bullshit because I've had students that came to a workshop, I'm not kidding you, in, yeah. in, in the south of uh, Italy with a Polaroid camera, an SX-70, and she took awesome pictures. And the gal with all the like is not that the like is not a great camera. Her pictures fell, fell flat. She had too many choices, too many lenses, too much crap around her neck. And the girl with the simple SX-70 got in there and got the picture. 
You know? This is like a real good saying. Too much crap around her neck. <laughs> Expensive crap. <laughs> Expensive good crap. stuff. But, uh, you know, I had it in my, in my studio in L.A., uh, up in Mendocino, where I teach sometimes, where the, so many cameras around their neck that they fall off on the floor. I've seen a lens explode. Come, too many lenses. I had a friend that took a workshop a couple years ago, and he was in my living room with a couple cameras and taking a picture. One fell off, and the lens exploded, hit the ground, and... You know, I shoot very simple. I light very simple, you know. But you do have, for instance, this, this shot. It doesn't look simple. Like it, it's, it's, well, that it's, shadow isn't simple, ironically. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that shot okay. was constructed, <laughs> the shot of Sharon Stone. Um, that was a shot for a, a campaign uh, for Dear Doors. And I actually photographed Sharon on the staircase Yeah. But the view out the window when we shot that was, was hillside. Okay. The other side of this person's house that we rented to make the pictures was a beautiful ocean landscape. So I sh we shot the ocean landscape and we put that behind Sharon. Okay. okay. So that's a composite. Um, but then let's talk about, you're also shooting a lot of nude stuff. Um, it's this... kind of an interesting story how that all came about, actually, Martin. I was... Uh, It was the early 80s, and my career was taking off, and I'd photographed uh, Dustin for Tootsie. I'd worked with Pacino on Scarface. I'd done the big chill. Yeah, I'll have all the shots here. We'd yeah. like, we'd just put it in yeah. while you're speaking. And I was getting all this work and these big jobs, and it was exciting. It was happening very, very fast. And I went to New York to visit a friend of mine, Antonio, the late Antonio Lopez, who was a very famous fashion illustrator. And I was probably in my early 30s, you know, kind of a young buck, kind of moving along. And Antonio said, so Greg, what are you doing? And I said, oh, Antonio, I just shot Tootsie, Big Chill, Scarface, like I was saying. And I thought, that's going to be impressive, right? And he says, uh, well, that's great, but what are you doing for yourself? It kind of stopped me cold in my tracks. And I thought, wow, I'm kind of a hired gun. I'm doing all this work, but it's for somebody else, not for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, if you want to have a career in the business and be happy and a career that substantiates longevity, you need to find something to do for yourself, something that's your own personal work outside of the realm of all this commercial work. And most of my work at that point, Martin, had been shooting in pretty close, big heads and, and, and uh, close-up portraits. portraits yeah. I developed my style, which was kind of the relationship between my dynamic range of strong highlights, harsh shadows. And I realized... I need to do something for me. And that's when I started to pull the camera back, shed the people of their clothes, still deal with working with the sense of shape, form, and balance that I had in my portraits, the same style of lighting so that my style didn't change. But I started creating work that was inherently mine. I didn't have to answer to someone else. I didn't have to take pictures of somebody else. They were for me. And that was, I think that's important for all photographers to have their own personal body of work. You know, you have a lot of photographers that are just commercial photographers. You have a lot of photographers that are strictly shoot for themselves fine artwork. So but you to never, find a happy medium is important. You, but you always did it like this. You always had the balance, or you always tried to have the balance between jobs and, and, and fun. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and there were times, you know, where you're in between jobs that you have that time, that little window of time to create your own work. And I think it's really important, and it's healthy. A good point, because I, I, I recently read in, in German blogging pages, web pages, that... A lot of photographers there, I'd say, try to exaggerate and, and, and try to say, well, my job is so much fun. I'm, not, I'm actually not working. It's, everything is so much fun. And, and, and oh, everything I do, I'm getting paid for, for, for having fun. And I'm, I'm always like, okay, my job is not that bad at all. But like, it's still a difference between being paid. What and level having, of fun you consider it to be. Yeah, you know? yeah. Is it like... Well, I think you have to look at it from this point of view. And I under, if you look at it from what he's saying and you take it <clears throat> the right way, he's correct. I mean, I feel very fortunate that I had a, a, such a long career doing something that I enjoyed. So, yes, it was fun. Yeah, yes, but, it was great because I could be having a nine-to-five sales job in a store picking up a paycheck. That wouldn't be fun. You, you have been working like, this is Kevin Costner, this is uh, Jared Letho, just it's like... You've been working with most astonishing actors and, and, and musicians all around the world. But still, you, you're telling me, 
I need something to have fun. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, I don't think it's, it's, it's the same not I feel. fun. I think it's a, no, 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 a it's, chance to do something outside of what people expect. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I didn't want to say that you don't have fun, but it's the same thing I, I, I'm feeling. It's, I do have a wonderful job and it, it's a lot of fun, but still it's different. It's, it's yeah. not the same as like working for someone else and working. Working for yourself. I, I yeah. think this is so important for our viewers because. Well, I think it is. I think it's really important because I think what's interesting is a lot of times, even when I'm teaching, I will tell my students, I'll say, okay, so figure out what it is you want to do. And when it's your turn to shoot, you have an idea. <clears throat> and then it's their turn to shoot. And I say, so what, what, do you, what do you have in mind? I don't know. I don't know. So it's one thing being told how to take a picture by an art director doing commercial work. It's another thing getting the creative juices flowing inside yourself to come up with your own personal vision. That's very important. Okay, okay. <clears throat> I'll try it. I'll drink something as well. <clears throat> so, what, is there any shot you would say, this is one of the most amazing shots you have done? Like, or is there, is, 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 is it like only remembering the time behind the camera with the person? Is it like the, the, the final result or is it, is more the, the, the time? Yeah, I don't think it's, it's rarely ever the final result. <clears throat> I think it's a combination of the working relationship with the talent, certainly. For me, one of the early highlights of my career was having the opportunity to work so often with David Bowie. He was kind of one of my heroes who, as an artist, I highly respected. Um, so certainly I was intimidated the very first time that we worked together. Then we became good friends and we worked together for many, many years. And uh, always challenging, always creative, always different ideas. So, you know, establishing great relationships. And that's part of the charm of photography is the fact that it brings together people and, you know, it works to sometimes, sometimes maybe it doesn't work, but, uh, you know, many of the relationships I established over the years, they have, became good friends. Have there actually been portraits, people, persons, you have not been able to establish like a connection? Like, was there? Well, sure. I mean, there's times when you're shooting that you just feel the communication is lacking. Um, and it's unfortunate, but like in any situation in the real world, There's people you like, there's people you don't like, there's people you get on famously with, there's people that, you know, you just as soon take a pass on. And you make the best of it that you can, and sometimes those situations work out, and sometimes you realize it wasn't meant for you. I always say, um, you know, when I worked with Pacino on Scarface, they warned me ahead of time that uh, he would be difficult, put long lenses on, and uh, you'd probably get thrown off the set. Well, I learned early on in my career that, uh, yeah. that the most important thing was to formulate your own opinions about people. Come into a relationship for the first time with a clean slate. You don't know if the person got laid the night before, if their dog got run over by a car, if they had a problem with their child. You don't know what's going on in their life. So the best is to come in with a clean slate and build your own relationship. With Pacino, we had a great relationship to the point that one day we were shooting on Scarface, <clears throat> and as a special photographer, you're given time to shoot in between while they're making a lighting change or changing sets, and there's a little bit of downtime. Then if you can get the cooperation of the actor, you can go off and make your own pictures. And we were shooting one day, and the assistant director came over and goes, Mr. Pacino, we're ready for you on the set. We're waiting for you. And he looked up at them and he says, well, Greg has been waiting for about an hour, and I'm working with him now. So it shows you... <laughs> how relationships are, are, are established and how important those relationships become. What I'm learning from this point is from, from the clean sheet. This is really important, I guess. This, um, so you're telling me even coming to a set where someone else is telling you, please mm -hmm. use long lenses. And, and this and is the publicist, the publicist for the film telling me this, which is really bullshit, you know. So that's the way she's setting it up. She's, she's creating distance, yeah. fear, intimidation, before you even meet the person. Now, what kind of a relationship is that to walk into? Crazy. Intimidation is a, is a, good, is a good topic to talk about because you, you already told me. I can tell before. you a funny story, yeah. I was doing a shoot um, once with Oliver Stone 
for uh, JFK. It was for GQ magazine. And as you can tell, I'm a pretty chatty person. And I'm setting up, and I've got Oliver over there, and his setting up, getting ready, and I'm standing on a couple apple boxes, and I'm talking to him, trying to kind of break the ice and get going, and Oliver looks up at me and he says, uh, can we cut the small talk, Greg, and can we take the picture? So I stepped down off the apple boxes and I walked right up in his face, and I said, Oliver, can I ask you something? And I think he was a bit taken aback, and he said, okay. I said, when you're shooting your movies, do you usually get it on the first take? And he looks at me and he goes, no, rarely. I said, then I'll let you know when I'm ready to take your picture. <laughs> and that's established boundaries. And boundaries are important because um, with celebrities, oftentimes they're much more comfortable playing a character other than themselves in front of the camera. And their defense mechanisms often is this kind of, and if they can win through intimidation, then you're fucked because you're never going to get the picture. The problem's going to be that they're going to have the upper hand. And I don't say come in as a tough guy and don't come in as a, a hard ass, but come in and meet the person halfway and try to build on the best common ground you can. But at the same time, don't give up your turf. It's important when you're making a portrait, and especially if you want a connected portrait and you want the person to respect you. But I'm never saying step outside that boundary of respect, but also don't become a mouseketeer at yeah, the same time. Yeah. So y you haven't been rude to him and Not you haven't rude. been like unfriendly and direct. You're just like, you, you wanted the same right he has. In exactly. His. Okay, this is, this is really important. Um, you, you, you told me, <clears throat> or you told us that the whole scene changed, the whole movie, celebrities, you have not that much time anymore, you, you get pushed way further as a photographer. You, would you like to do it again? Well, I mean, I think if, if you really go back to the beginning, like what really helped launch my career were my early days with Interview Magazine, which would be before your time, but in the early 80s, um, there was a handful, a very small handful of, of photographers that we worked for interview for Andy Warhol's magazine. And uh, we would be given a star that we would shoot the cover for and either given their home number usually or a connection. And we would book our own makeup, our own hair, our own stylus. We would find a location where we wanted to shoot a house. Usually we'd rent a house. And we'd take the talent there and make the pictures. We would then send the magazine five or six pictures for the inside and a few cover choices. That was it. They ran the pictures. It was really us as an author, photographer, so to speak, not being dictated to by the magazine that this is what we have to have, this is what the pictures must look like, they've got to wear these clothes. We had full control. Full control. That doesn't happen anymore. That's finished. That's so long gone. Unless you're doing you know, certain fashion layouts and things where you do that. I never was a fashion photographer. I was always a personality photographer. So today, as you know, it's just changed. It's more like catalog photography, and it's not... We lack the, the luxury of what we used to be able to do. So at that point in time, that's when I decided, let's make a little wine, let's uh, do some <laughs> let's teaching. Let's work wine. on our own personal projects. Let's jump slightly back to, to, to technical gear talk, but not, not the crap around the <laughs> neck stuff, but, but the lighting. Lighting is very, very important for your images. And I, I guess you are, you are focusing on, on, a, on a psychological layer of working with people, but still you are kind of a genius uh, setting light. You well, I mean, lighting is obviously everything. And I think that um, I light very simply, as you can tell from my pictures. You know, I've, sometimes we'll go in a studio and I'll see a person shooting and they got four, five, six lights going on. I light with a single point light source. I'll usually start with a single light, find my angles. You know, when I'm shooting, <clears throat> let's kind of back up a little bit. When I'm shooting, I always start in very close because like I'm sitting very close to you so there's an intimacy yeah. that's being established between yeah. you and I yeah. because the distance is small. It's the same thing I tell students when they're looking, I'm looking at their pictures, crop close get rid of that distance, get rid of any distraction. So for you and I, if we're meeting for the first time and I'm going to photograph you, I want to be right in your face. I want to look what's good on your face, what's bad on your face, what I want to play up in the highlights, what I want to play down in the shadows. But this is totally different than most of the photographers like, are telling that stuff. Like They are working 
actually the, the, the complete different direction. They are starting like far further away and as they continue to shoot, they are approaching further and closer and closer and closer by. Never been, my, never been my approach. Why would I want to start further away from a person? It makes it harder. Well, I mean, you don't know what you're dealing with. There's no intimacy. There's a lack of communication, lack of connection. Um, by starting in close, figuring out what's wrong with your face, what's good on your face. Then when I pull the camera back, I can move you one way or another and know that I'm going to be capturing you at your best. Also, we also have now had a chance to kind of bond and build upon a relationship, which is hard to do if I'm standing back there with your cameraman. And we, you look at the distance between the two of us. Yeah. It's hard for he and I to get connected because it's, it's too far away. He's not seeing details no. on your skin, on your face, on your eyes. And, yeah. and, and, and yeah. so, you know, being in close, I can see if the nose is going one way, if one eye is smaller, jawline one way or another is better, cheekbones are better, what I need to do. And this way I know what I want to play up in the highlights, what I want to play down in the shadows. If you say play up in the highlights and play low in the play shadows. Play down in the shadows. Um, um, this is kind of... Kind of Focusing on the good spots and, and getting rid of the bad parts. Bad, bad part in the shadows and the good part in the light. Yeah. Okay. okay. And it's also something that I learned early on. When I started taking pictures, Martin, the light was almost always over the camera. Everything was lit in broad light. The pictures looked like interchangeable postage stamps. They look good. The people look good. But the pictures lacked the dimension and the depth that I became probably more known for in my little bit later work as I was building and establishing a style. And I think when a picture answers all the questions and leaves nothing to the imagination, you walk away with the picture. Uh, maybe you're satisfied, but you don't want to come back to that picture or revisit that picture, or it may not get you thinking more about that picture. When there's something left to the imagination, I think that the picture's much more successful. But this, think, this is not only with photography. This is kind of... Art, with, anything. With music, a lot of stuff, yeah. yeah literature. So you're also saying that Your photographs are intended to, to, to let grow imagination and, and fantasy and creativity inside the viewer's head. Right. I mean, one of the things that's funny, if you take a lot of times when, you're doing, when I'm doing my figure studies or my nudes, let's say we're doing a male nude, it's not about, oh, well, I'm doing a male nude, I have to see all the front genitalia. It's more about maybe creating a little mystique. Same with shooting a woman. Um, You don't necessarily have to show everything to make the picture have a very sensual quality. I think leaving a little bit to the imagination, it's not about being more tasteful or discreet. It's about creating a more intriguing image. And I think at the end of the day, that's what we all want, is we want a picture that leaves you asking more questions. I think those are successful pictures. Pictures leaving you with more questions and answers okay okay I'm, i'm see I'm, i'm really sorry because i, I i'm i'm so slow in in asking no no you, i think but, you're doing great to, your english to. is much better than my german <laughs> <laughs> okay but okay but it's not a oh, different topic i i just have to think about a lot of things you say because it's so true <laughs> so also martin we were getting back to the lighting and we kind of deviated a little bit from yeah. the talk about lighting But I tend to like to light with a single point light source. I was mentioning that I walk into sometimes the studios and there's lights everywhere and there's yeah. lights coming here, lights over there. When I start with a single light, I can really sculpt a face. I can figure out, and same with the nude, I can figure out really what that person looks like, what's working, what's not working. Then I can add and subtract light. And that's really where I come in with most of, of Peter's bounce gear because I like a single light source, and then I can put a black in if I want to subtract light, suck some light out of the picture, or add a silver or a white reflector or a little edge if I want to with just a little bit of fill. And that's really how I like to sculpt and, and, and photograph people. But you're doing it like on the set, in the light. You're not doing it like photoshopping, no. uh, increasing depth. Uh, one of the things I stress uh, tremendously, and it's one of the big things that was the big part with dealing with art directors in the day. They go, oh, don't worry about it. We'll fix it in Photoshop. <laughs> well, you know, forget that. Let's fix it in the camera. Let's get our exposure right. Let's get our, our, our framing right. Let's get everything right in the camera. And then we have less room to have to move in Lightroom or Photoshop. Um, it's, it's, it's crazy how uh, people want to just figure they're going to make the picture in Photoshop. And they're not going to make the picture in Photoshop. They can maybe enhance the picture, but are they going to get a better picture, 
better only from uh, technical tools, better in terms of the person, the energy, and the photograph? I don't think so. I don't think so. Energy of photograph. This kind of looks or sounds, you know, the star signs and, 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 and those, those, those readings where you, today you'll have a day which is going to be really, really good. You have a good energy flow and uh, try to use I'm not into chance. all that. That's no, 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 but bullshit. you're talking yeah. about energy. Yeah. What, what, if you're not into star signs and yeah. stuff like that. But I'm still talking about talking the energy about coming from within the person through the eyes, the trajectory. Um, a lot of that is done through building trust and confidence in the person, sharing your vision with the person. I always show the talent that I'm working with what I'm doing and talk to them so that they become a team player with me. I mean, I think from many photographers would sit here and shoot you and they talk, look at their pictures and shoot you and look at the pictures. They don't show you anything. It creates a distance again, you know, and create, puts your mind into thinking about what's going on. But if I share my vision with you and we work together, we're going to end up with a better end result. So you're showing a lot of your shots right during the photo shooting. Absolutely. You're explaining what are your tensions are. You, 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 you're also saying this is not right as I want it to be. This has to be done better. Or yeah, this I like think we need to go here. There. I think you need to be um, not so flexible that you give the talent too much room to move. In other words, I think that a lot of times dealing with celebrities, if I was to come into a situation and say, well, what do you think? I don't know. I cannot be not sure of myself. I have to be in control. I have to be in command. If I come in and I'm like wishy-washy or I don't know, then that's going to make the <laughs> talent know. insecure because yeah. they're going to think you don't know what the hell you're doing. So you have to have the upper hand in that area and be demonstrative and, and constructive in terms of how you share your vision with the talent when they're looking at the picture. But at the same time, they must realize that you know what you're doing. I mean, that's critical, obviously. Yeah, yeah, but, but it's, it's, it's a very fine, fine balance, balance to yes. find. Uh, it, being a personality photographer is part psychologist, part photographer, you know. Part it's a joint, a joint yeah, adventure. Yeah. This is what makes it so difficult, but also so fascinating. Yes. Um, and I guess sometimes you, we have the chance to get closer to some of the guys we take pictures of than any other person in the world. Just because... I think so, because basically even doing a portrait is like taking your clothes off. It's like bearing your soul. So it becomes a very personal situation in relationship to uh, other, way, other things, for sure. I'm still talking about the, the, the sentence you said with a good photograph has to... A good photograph has to open more questions? A good photograph doesn't necessarily answer all the questions, yeah. But it leaves something to your imagination. So you need black, you need shadows, you need kind of posings and, and stuff, not being that, that flat. Well, I think it's just, you know, keeping a little bit uh, of mystery in the, uh, in the image, I think is always good. But I think, you know, for me, most of my portraits really are about the eyes. It's really focusing into kind of the window of the soul really getting a feeling of that person coming out. So Greg Gorman is kind of working, coming to the studio, talking to the person he takes pictures of, then explaining what he's going to do. Then you're going to be setting like one light and starting really close to get, first of all, to not get like the final shots, but just to get in touch with the person you take pictures of. Yeah. Well, generally so. how I'll start is I'll spend time with the person in the makeup room, if I don't know them, let's say, looking at their face and angles. And Do you then, tell them that... Hold no, on, I'm, I'm sitting I'm there usually having a conversation. I don't so you're doing it like... Just besides looking normal. and we're, we're yeah. also getting connected. And I always have like a full-time chef that break, we break bread always before the shoot. We always have a meal together. And then based upon what the purpose of the shoot is, this is an editorial shoot. Am I shooting a magazine layout for some specific magazine with a specific goal? Is this a motion picture campaign? Is this an advertisement? In, a, in, a, in, a, in other words, a testimonial. So I may have four or five things going on, different setups, different shots. I will basically tell my first assistant, this is what I want set up here. Over here, I want a window light with maybe a little bit of fill. Up on the roof, I maybe want a little bit uh, LED fill on the left side and bounce on the right. They'll set everything up roughly. Roughly, yeah, then I yeah. come in and I fine tune everything with the talent once the talent's in front of there. I massage with the light. With the talent, yeah. not like. So, in other words, you know, I'll, I'll hone in. It's the same as like working in Lightroom, you know, 
And Lightroom is Lightroom does all your heavy lifting. Okay, all your general, your global adjustments are done in Lightroom, and then your fine tuning is done in Photoshop. It's the same thing here. Basically, they'll get the global setup, the lights in the right place, roughly, and and yeah, we'll switched start on that way. <laughs> at least <Yeah>. working. <laughs> And then I'll come in and move them around, and um, and that's kind of how it goes on that part of it. But actually, you are actually moving around the lights, or is yeah. it like, are you telling someone to get the lights? Both. Well, a lot of times I'm moving the lights, sure. Because I'm not helpless yet. I'm <laughs> hopeless, <laughs> no. hopeless maybe, but helpless no, not no, yet. It, it, it so wasn't, no, I still, I still move the lights and, and do things around, sure. It wasn't the intention of my yeah. question, Greg. It was just like, uh, I know photographers, they, they, they wouldn't, in front of this uh, star or in front of the, the person they're taking pictures, actually take the light or stand and move it there or there. They would just like be the, the great photographer. And uh, like That's a bunch of bullshit. I'm part of the team and we're all working together at the same results. And usually, you know, I'll set my lights as well, uh, Martin. I'll have them where I want them. And then I walk behind the subject to see if the sweet spot of the light is really on the person. Because I can have a light here lighting you coming in at this direction. I mean, look. And it's above you, over to the side. So if I go behind, and it'll still light you, and you're going to look fine. But if I go behind you, I can make sure that the sweet spot of that light is like right directed on you. And that's really important. Okay. And then you, you take like the first pictures and start real, real close. What lens do you normally use? Like, That's a good question. I, know I use very long lenses. Um, I tend to shoot, uh, when I'm doing most of my portraits, I'm usually, I'm in 35 millimeter, I'm generally never less than, uh, I'd say 180 to 200. I'm millimeter. usually at the long end of my zoom. But how can, you, how can you start really close when you're using like 200 millimeter? Well, I mean, I'm back, I'm close. I mean, I could be... Not, we're not back as far as David, but half the distance between where okay. David is and the edge of this couch, that's still pretty close. Okay. But I'm also walking in and talking to the person. Ah, okay. I mean, like three steps from being on top of the person, so it's close. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> so it's not, uh, not a great distance. But then you can, or in some cases, you will just like increase the distance for well, some I shots with like upper I mean, body I, shots. I, I like to shoot in close, as you know. Yeah. A lot of my work is very tight. But... Uh, You know, I mean, and I, and I will massage the picture to get all the elements right. When I'm teaching, I tell the students, it's funny, um, we'll usually have like a window. They'll maybe have 20 minutes to make their picture, and they're panicked that they're going to get a picture in 20 minutes. And I say, look, if you take 15 minutes or 18 minutes of your 20 minutes to get all the elements right, <clears throat> to get the lighting right, to get the positioning right, yeah. to have taken the time to walk around your subject 360 degrees to see what is the best angle, Uh, in terms of where the light is. Maybe the light is here, and it's a front key light, but the actual better shot is shooting from over here with the key light more as a backlight and more shadow in the front. So yeah. taking that time and then taking two to three minutes once all the elements have been dismissed, everything's been taken care of, <clears throat> exposure, all your tests, um, your framing, your background, the positioning of your subject, and then you take two minutes to actually get your picture. That's all you really need. People spend too much time, especially when I'm teaching and they're doing a nude, they come out the door banging off pictures. And you know, the chance of getting a great picture is, you know, it's a shot in the dark. But if they massage the whole picture and they get all the elements in place and position. Without the camera. No, with the camera and looking through the camera. And that's one of the biggest issues I always say when I'm teaching is, while you're directing the talent, look through your lens. Because I'm, for example, I'm six foot three. If I stand there and I talk to you and I'm holding the camera down here, when I get ready to shoot, it's a different angle. So I basically may do simple positioning, but then I'm directing through the camera with simple moves like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I just had a question, very important question. Um, do you think that today's or nowadays photographers are like trying to not make a decision? Because that is what... I always see in, in, in a lot of photographers, they, they try to get all the shots they could possibly get f in one set from one person. So they're like moving from there to there to there, from up to down, from low to high. From They, they even change lenses in between like two or three times. Oh, let's see how the two, uh, 70 to 200 looks. And I was, uh, I'm always like, why didn't you just decide it in the beginning that yeah. you wanted to have like a longer lens. Like, 
Is it like yeah? I mean, it, I agree. I agree with you totally. I think you know. I think they're a little bit lost, and I think that uh, one of the things I say, as well as after getting everything set, sometimes the photographer will take the time, get, and then they'll go click, 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 and I go, you know, pixels are free. This is not like shooting in the dark ages with film. This is, <laughs> no, you know, you're not paying for pixels. <laughs> and uh, what I tell them, I said, you know, you've taken all this time to set your shot. And now you've got a couple minutes to shoot, but you shoot three frames, five frames. I said, what the hell is that about? The person is still probably trying to exhale, trying to <clears throat> understand what it is you want, get comfortable within the parameters of what you've set up to shoot. Like some micro And then getting everybody, yeah. getting them to the point that they're relaxed enough right. that you really communicate and you really connect. Take a couple hundred pictures. They always say to me, why do you shoot so many pictures, Greg? They're all going to be the same. Trust me, they're not the same. <laughs> they're not the same. You know, I can have 500 pictures of one person, and they're, they're different. So you're telling me, take your time setting up the shot? Don't rush it. Don't rush it, but then when you actually start, then just go like, for it. Go for it and, <laughs> exactly. and fill the card. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That is so interesting, because I, I thought you as someone being grown up in, in analog times, you would have told me to, to rest it. Uh, Trust me, if you realize how many hours I spend editing versus shooting, it's <laughs> crazy. I mean, I was doing a shoot with my boyfriend, actually. We were in, teach, I was teaching a workshop in uh, Austria last year, and I'd been teaching for a week, setting up shots for all the students for the whole week, and at the end of the week, I thought I wanted to take my boyfriend take some pictures in one part of the castle. And so with my assistant, Josh, and I, we walked over there with Sam, and we went into this part of the castle to shoot. And in, I think it was maybe one hour and one hour, 15 minutes, I did about seven or eight setups, and I took 4,500 pictures. 4,500 4, pictures. 4,500 An hour and 15, hour and 20 minutes. And I got a lot of great pictures. But, but it just goes to show you, I mean, you know, and this is, I knew what I wanted, so I'm not changing a bunch of lenses. Sure, I walked around to find the locations where I wanted to shoot, and I moved him relatively to what I wanted to shoot. And pretty much he was either naked or wearing a shirt or something. It was pretty, you know, I was doing kind of somewhat mostly nudes. Uh, not a million changes. Different body language, different location, similar setups. 4,500 4, pictures, yeah. And, and people ask me, so when you do a shoot like that, Greg, are you excited and you sit down at the end of the shoot and do your edit? I back up my pictures to the server, to wherever I have them. In this case, where I'm traveling to two hard drives, sometimes three, and I'll build my Lightroom catalog. And then I let it rest. I walk away from it for a day or two. I let you never, everything digest. Sometimes I do if I'm on deadline, but if but it's a personal Without shoot, a deadline, you would never do it on the same spot? Like Not generally. I might look through just to get an idea, but I like to have a little bit of time to just kind of distance. digest everything. Yeah, okay. to let it kind of settle. Because, like, I knew when I shot Sam in this last, that the picture, I knew I got great pictures. And it was some of the best work I'd done in the last few years. One, there was an attraction there, which always helps if the person you're shooting with is someone you have an interest in. Doesn't have to be a relationship, but someone that you're excited about photographing. And two, you know, and, and that all stems from passion. To me, that would be the single most important word to describe any profession that someone is going to be proficient at and good at, is to have passion. Because I think when you lose your passion... You lose your drive, you lose your focus, you lose intent, and you lose basically the quality and, the, and what you become recognized for. And that's really why I really quit dealing with all the movie stuff. I knew at a certain point around 2005, 2006, that it didn't interest me anymore. And the amount of work and the time goods. I put into my pictures for 25, 30 years of the really, when I was kind of on the top of the hit parade, well, that was gone. And so I knew that, you know, from a point of view of producing the best work of my life in that genre, motion picture campaigns and the person I said, that was gone. I wasn't going to produce better work than I did in that period where I was hungry and passionate about that body of work. It doesn't mean I can't take a good picture, I don't think, but that part of the, my career was kind of going to the side now. You are amazingly realistic. Like, like It's it's amazing. It's I'm 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 really I'm really astonished. It's like very positive. I think to have such. I think the hardest part for us is always to to see boundaries and to see like 
to look at yourself is always very hard because you can easily teach and, 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 and talk to others and, 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 and see their position, but to, 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 to actually feel right about your position, it's, it's really hard. And well, I think it's important. I think it's important to have perspective. I think, you know, ego is something that should be checked at the door in this ego business from the beginning. You got enough egos with the people on the other side of the camera that you don't need to walk in. And, you know, a lot of photographers walk in with this big ego and they come I mean, I think that's a bunch of bullshit. There's not room for two egos in a room and generally the, the subjects in the world of celebrity, not all of them, because many of them are just awesome people, but sometimes some of them come in and they believe their own press and at that point, you know, you're, <laughs> you're on another page. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's... I, I've learned so many things in, in the last minutes. I'm, I'm, my head is like bursting full of information. Probably because you're tired of getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning. No, 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 no. I'm so <laughs> I'm wait. impressed that you came from so early. That's amazing. No, Greg, I'm, I'm really amazed. You taught me a lot of things. Uh, teaching is another thing. Let's talk about your workshops. There are still one or two places in France, I guess. I some. have a, a, a three workshops this summer from Atelier Youngworth, and yeah. we can give you the yeah, we can, URL we can, or we can, whatever. Yeah, That'd be great. We can put it but underneath. They're, they're exciting workshops. So we have a couple spaces. They're very affordable. And we do one in, in uh, Styria, one in Bellate, which is near Milano, and one in Provence. And the workshops are all inclusive with the workshop and the, and the, tui the tuition. Lodging and meals, pretty good deal. And uh, the <coughs> wine in this area is amazing. Wines are great in all three areas. I mean, you know, you're yeah, talking I know about that. <laughs> Austria has, you know, great wines. I mean, you know, one of my favorite wine, Austrian wines, of course, is Gruner Veltliner. It's a great, great Gruner Veltliner. It's coming from Austria and Sauvignon Blanc, some really yeah. fantastic Alsatian wines. And Italy, of course, you've got the big Nebbiolas, the Barolas and Barbarescas. And France, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's the Burgundies and the Cote de Rhone's and... Master of Photography and Wine. Uh, well, I still have to learn a lot. Greg, thank you for being thank here. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time and generosity. I appreciate no, it. No, I hope I, I will see you in Zings the next years. So no, we time. didn't get to hang out. It's funny, you know, as I get older, and I believe me, I could party with the best of them, but when I'm teaching, I'm very protective of my time that I get enough rest so that I can put the energy into the... For the students. For I me, know. that's the most important thing. So I wasn't in the tent as often as I used to be in the early <laughs> 10 years ago when the festival first started and I came with Peter and had an exhibition. But uh, I had a really great time. On my days off, I was out riding bikes and in the countryside. So <laughs> I just want to thank you, California Sundowns, for having Greg here in Germany and for having us here in the headquarters in, in Hamburg. And, um, well, I hope that you and California Sun the Sunbonds will, will continue to make great work and, 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 and be uh, fascinating for the whole photography scene. Um, I would just say, let's end it here. We, we still have to talk about some of the shots here. It's just like, well... I think a fun picture is the picture I made in Zinks this year, oh, <coughs> which was... Uh, I was doing some lighting demos and uh, my assistants... I know, I love this picture. And... Um, My assistant said, I just saw this worker come out of one of the tank halls and the most amazing face. And uh, he was a gentle giant. His name was Mike. And uh, he came over and this was shot actually with a rotolite in the studio LED, but combined with many uh, reflectors from California Sunbounce, some bounce fill under the eyes yeah. with a black over the head to really suck in the detail in his forehead and a little bit of uh, soft fill on the uh, right side of the picture, which is actually his left side. So actually, I think three sun bounce reflectors and a road light. So again, single point light source and then additive and subtractive like, light. But a great like face, huh? A devil. Yeah, if he, the, the, but the, he the was forehead. a total gentle giant. Yeah, amazing. But you, you've like modulated the, the, the forehead to, to... Well, it was, it was almost, yeah, just amazing face, you know, just awesome face. So it was, you know, for my demonstration with dealing with light and shadow, he was perfect. Yeah. Amazingly. See you next time, hopefully on uh, future videos. And um, hopefully you can see Greg on one of the workshops or perhaps in, in California. I'd love to come there, yeah. drink some wine. Come Beer and take a workshop in California. I yeah. will. <laughs>